sport. Winning is what it's all about. But how do you win? This man has learned the hard way. Now, he's ready to show you. If we want to learn about the exploits of some of the earliest warriors and the weapons they fought with, we need only look in the Bible. The Old Testament gives a detailed military history of the 12 tribes of the Israelites and their fight for survival. This time on Conquest, we experience the weapons of the Bible. The lands of the Bible are squeezed between the Mediterranean Sea and the desert. To the north is Syria and Asia Minor. To the south, Egypt. To the east, the empires of Mesopotamia. This area used to be called the land of Canaan. It's only 70 miles wide, and it's absolutely essential in a strategic position as the sole land bridge between Eurasia and Africa. In times of peace, it was essential for commerce. In wartime, essential for military maneuver. The Israelites controlled most of this land for most of 12 centuries. We're going to find out how they did it, and you are going to learn how to win with the weapons of the Bible. In the 18th century BCE, there was a great movement of peoples from the east into the eastern Mediterranean, of which the major group were the Hyksos. They invaded Egypt and defeated the mighty Egyptian army, who were equipped with inferior weapons of stone, wood, and early bronze. The Hyksos succeeded partly by military technology. They had superior bronze weapons and the ultimate shock force of fast chariots and an excellent missile weapon, the Asiatic Composite Bow. Now, this was of recurved design, made of horn and sinew with an effective range of 200 yards. The only disadvantage of this was that it was extremely difficult and expensive to make and often took up to a year to finish. Now, these modern copies are 55 pounds draw weight which is extremely strong for a small bow, and uh, so strong, in fact, I'm going to need help stringing it. So, could you give me a push? Now, these were truly powerful weapons. From now on, massed archery ruled the battlefield. So, you'd better learn how to use these. Archery was so effective in this period because good armor was rare. Most was of stiffened cloth or leather, sometimes strengthened with scales of bronze, with helmets of hardened leather or bronze. Eventually, Egypt expelled the Hyksos by copying the weapons of their enemies, especially the bow and the chariot. By the time of the New Kingdom in Egypt, the Israelites were treated as a hostile population. Sometime during the 13th century BCE, they were led out of bondage in Egypt by their leader, Moses. Later, under Joshua, they began the conquest of the land of Canaan. At this time, the Israelites were still nomadic. They were a collection of individual Bronze Age warriors. They fought with a spear and javelin, bows and slings, clubs, many types of axes, swords and shields. These are the classic weapons of the ancient period, but what's important is what they were made of. Now, they still used flint and stone warheads and blades, and these could be extremely sharp, but they had to be short and they often shattered on impact. The best blades were made of metal. The first metal blades were made of copper, but this is an extremely soft material. But if you take seven parts copper, to one part of tin, you get an alloy called bronze. Now here's a nice new shiny bronze axe head. This was a very much harder material and could take a good edge, but you still had to be careful with it. It was brittle and it could blunt very easily. And in the Middle East, bronze was often of poor quality because of the rarity of tin, but it made some good weapons. Right, team, it's time we learned how to use these bronze weapons. And the one thing you won't be doing with them is any kind of Hollywood sword play, like this. <laughs> bronze weapons simply will not stand up to this. These are modern steel copies. Let's look at the real thing. First, with a long sword, 
It's absolutely pointless to try and think of any kind of cuts against bronze armor or bronze shields. All you're going to do is blunt your sword. Also, you're not going to be able to take any kind of parry. Do you thrust at me? There's a good chance that your sword or mine will break, so don't allow your sword to be cut down onto. Now, these aren't useless weapons, but you just have to rethink your whole idea of sword play. You push shield against shield, and you try and find the gaps, the unarmored places on the body, low on the leg, up to the face, into the gut. Now, there were various different types of swords called kopesh. Now, these are based on an Egyptian design. It's almost impossible to believe that this sort of sword was actually used, but they're shown throughout antiquity, so they must have been used somehow. One like this would certainly be used as a cutting, slashing weapon. I would try and smash your shield aside and then come in with a head cut to smash right through it, cleave through it, and through you. Now, the bronze spearhead meant that the spear could really come into its own as a fighting weapon. Spear fighting technique is a whole technique to itself. There's all kinds of thrusts and parries. If you parry too far out, don't, because I can come under and in. Now, the short spear, the javelin, the bronze head made it a much more effective weapon. It made it much better balanced and a much deadlier weapon. different types of axe. Everything from this double-handed monster to this nice, short, sharp one. Now, with this, it does have a sharp blade, but frankly, that's not important with this. This one relies on weight. You try and cleave through your opponent's shield or armor. Now, I'm going to cut at you. I want you to try and hit back at me, all right? Yeah! Very good. Not finished yet. Ah! Yeah, you're too good at this. Go away. From around 9000 BCE began the process we call civilization. Settled agricultural states were established and the ownership of land became important for the first time. Defense of the land and the new possibilities for trade led to the creation of the first walled cities and to the formation of the first semi-professional armies. Now, you guys will be armed with short swords or axes, with spears and with shields and with some basic armor basic armor and helmets of bronze or leather. So pick up your shields, follow me. In Sumeria, we find the earliest phalanx formation, with troops trained to fight and march together, to obey orders and to keep close formation. 1,500 years later, the Canaanites fought in much the same way. These are the troops the Israelites had to face, and these are the tactics they had to learn. Shields! The Israelites fought with these early armies and learned from them. But their battles against the Canaanites could do little to prepare them for their next and greatest enemies. Coming up, the team learn how to win against the Philistines. Our team have been training with bronze weapons. But just like the Israelites, they are about to be overtaken by technology. From around 1200 BC, a group called the Sea Peoples invaded the Middle East, probably from Asia Minor or the Aegean. Among them were the Philistines. They invaded and settled the southwest coast of Canaan, and they became mortal enemies to the Israelites. They were probably the first true swordsmen. They used a sword of about three foot long with a small shield that we would call a buckler. But the really important thing about these guys is that their weapons were made of iron. Now, it's difficult to understand how important and how terrifying this change was. Just imagine you have a well-equipped army with bronze weapons being absolutely carved to pieces by these new iron ones. The Israelites really had a problem. By the mid-11th century BCE, the Philistines had beaten back the Israelites and established themselves deep into Judah. Saul was chosen to lead the Israelites. 
and he created a professional standing army of about 3,000 men. We particularly remember the exploits of two of Saul's men. The first was his eldest son, Jonathan. Now, the Philistines were strongly encamped at a place called Mishmash. They had a small advance guard out ahead of them. Jonathan and his shield-bearer left the main Israelite army and skirted around, attacked the advance guard, and routed it. Just the two of them. You've got to be kidding. Well, no, you mustn't underestimate the effect of a surprise attack. You see your friends falling all around you. You run away. You have to tell everyone, we've just been attacked by a huge horse. The main Philistine camp is thrown into confusion. They begin to retreat. The retreat becomes a rout. So, how many people were in the advance guard? Well, we don't know, but probably around 20. But we're supposed to believe that two defeated 20. There's no way. Well, maybe there is a way. We have to look at the idea of Jonathan and his shield bearer. There's a lot of mention of the shield-bearer in ancient texts. Now, this guy may just have been a slave to carry his master's heaviest piece of equipment. But what if he wasn't? What if he was part of an active team of two? Now, most soldiers have the same problem. Only part of their mind is focused on aggressive intent. The other part is thinking about defense, about survival. This immediately cuts his aggressive effectiveness by 50% or more. And every soldier he meets has the same priorities. But what if you trusted someone enough to rely on him entirely for your defense. That would mean that you could get rid of your own shield and concentrate entirely on attack. Now, if you guys train together effectively, you can make a really great fighting team. I think if you had a lot of time to practice, you could fight like this really well, um, but you'd have to work together for a long period of time to get in perfectly in tune. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, together, I can see how this could be a very deadly combo but a lot of time and energy. You almost, you almost have to be you know, brothers, in a sense. They were pretty well guarded a lot of the time. And when you were trying to attack one, the other one always seemed to get you. Yeah, we really had a tough time trying to synchronize our attack. And we had to really work together in order to separate them. Uh, lateral movement, kind of flanking movements, worked real well against them. It's time for you guys to learn one of the oldest and simplest weapons ever invented, and one of the most difficult to master, the sling. We have two types. This is the heavy sling. It throws a large rock a remarkably long distance. This is particularly useful in siege warfare and against closely packed masses of troops. The lighter version throws a much smaller stone. Now, these little stones can go with amazing accuracy and speed. The stone goes inside the cup of the sling. The loop of the sling is placed over these three fingers. And the loose end is held between the thumb and forefinger. Now, there are various techniques for throwing. You can either throw underhand or overhand. The classic method is to swing it around the head. When you reach the right speed, you release. In certain cultures, and among all sheep-rearing societies, the sling was taught to every boy from childhood. It kept wolves away from the sheep, and of course it was always an excellent weapon of war. But the most effective weapon of the period was the war chariot. Now we keep on hearing about chariots, and we know exactly what they look like, because some have actually survived from New Kingdom Egypt. This is a modern reproduction. The originals were incredibly light, only 77 pounds. They had a great range for those days of up to 37 miles per day, and the closing speed in battle was 24 miles per hour. Now, these chariots were mostly with two horses and two riders. One was the driver, you, Scott. Now, you would hold those reins in your right hand because in your left hand, you'd hold that shield. Now, that was to protect the really important guy, Chris, who was the archer. Now, you'd be lashed on into position to give you the stability required to shoot your bow. The chariot itself was packed with masses of quivers full of arrows and loads of javelins for throwing at short range. This whole setup was incredibly expensive. Think of a $4.3 million M1A1 Abrams tank. There was the archer, who would either be a nobleman or a first-class professional soldier, his bow, scale armor and equipment, the charioteer was also a highly skilled professional. The horses would also often be armoured, requiring a huge staff to breed, train and feed them. 
But why was the chariot so important when it contains only one archer? Well, the trick is that it combines the two classic capabilities of infantry, shock and missile capability. The bows the charioteers used were of the highest quality, far better than any used by the common soldier. Let's go! Yeah! The chariot could run rings around infantry formations, attacking them in the flank and in the rear, always keeping out of range. If the infantry did try to charge them down, well, the chariot just ran away, and you could shoot backwards, hit them as they came on. When the infantry fled, you could easily catch them up and ride them down. They were excellent for scouting work, for lightning raids, and for bringing back intelligence quickly. And as in open warfare, the only defense against a chariot was another chariot. Everybody wanted one. Right, we have another test for you. Here's the chariot, and there are the horses. <laughs> We're going to drive you around a circle of four targets. I want you to hit three of them with arrows, one of them with a javelin. Let's rock and load. Yes, that's what I meant. The ability to shoot a bow and throw a spear from a bouncing chariot at full speed was vital. But as our team discover, the rock and roll really make the lock and load difficult, let alone actually hitting the target. But after a few tries, our team get the hang of it, and they manage to hit some targets as they sweep by. Next, our team combines the ancient skills they have learned to compete against each other using the weapons of the Bible. Right, team, for your final challenge, we've set you a course of various combat tasks. You'll get a point for each hit, and the course will be run at a fast pace. First, you'll have a spear fight with padded spears. Then, you'll have to hit that target with arrows, javelins, and slingshot. And finally, you jump in the chariot and hit your targets on the move. Good luck. First up, it's Chris against Scott with the padded spears. Whoever gets two solid strikes to their opponent's body will win the first round of the challenge. Go. Both men stand their ground. But in an instant, they strike simultaneously, and each score hits. But then Chris flies forward and gets a second solid hit to Scott's stomach. Hit that! In his hasty retreat, Scott sprains his ankle. This may hinder his chances in the next two rounds of the challenge. Next up are Dan and Dave. Both fighters are more cautious, looking for an opening. Dan uses his hand to deflect Dave's attacks and then makes a stab to his opponent's stomach. Dave's looking for revenge now and gets a hit to Dan's chest. Good hit! Dave blocks a shot to his face but misses a double hit to his stomach. Dan wins two points in the first round to tie for the lead with Chris. Next up, it's round two. Scott shakes off his twisted ankle and sets himself up for the second round. He scores a point with his first arrow, but misses with the second, then loses his concentration and misses both javelins and slingshots. He's off to the third round with only two points. Next up is Dan. Surprisingly, he misses both shots with the bow, but makes up for it with two hits using the javelin. The slingshot continues to give our guys problems as Dan misses with both stones. Dave, still sore after losing the spear fight to Dan, lines up his bow and knocks up two accurate hits for two points to get him back in the game. But then blows his chance for the lead by missing his next three attempts. Only a hit with his final slingshot keeps his hopes of winning alive. Chris races to his mark and immediately gets another point, then narrowly misses with his second arrow. But two lucky javelin hits make up for his inaccuracy with the sling and he exits round two just in the lead. Come on, come Scott's on. first up into the chariot yeah. and immediately he's back on track with two hits out of two. But then he loses his concentration and just misses the third arrow target and the javelin target worth two points. He ends up with only four points. Yeah! Dan starts off well, nailing the first soldier. 
but then fails to knock the arrow and completely misses the second target. No excuses now, as he has plenty of time to line up the third, and he gets it. But can he get the double point with his javelin? No. Dan ends up our current leader with six points. Dave is determined to be our latest conquest champion and starts off strong. But then he fumbles and drops his second arrow and can't recompose himself and misses the third target. Only the javelin can keep him in the running. And he gets it, scoring two points for a total of seven to move past Dan. Finally, Chris lashes himself to the chariot, and we're off. Chris gets the first, second, and third targets with authority, but can he get the javelin too? No. But it doesn't matter. Chris has won with eight points and is this week's Conquest champion. The warriors of the Bible used a whole array of weapons, first of stone, then bronze, and finally iron. Our team has experimented with many different and surprising techniques of combat as we have learned how to win with the weapons of the Bible.